Good evening, everybody, and or wherever you may be, good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to uh, this special event, this seminar as part of the Peking University School of Transnational Law, Beijing Dashi Guoji Fa Yuan's Law and Humanities Seminar Series, Fa Lu Yu Wen Wen Shi Lie Jiang Zuo. My name is Norman Ho. I teach uh, at the Peking University School of Transnational Law and also am the convener of the seminar series. Uh, we're very privileged and honored today to have with us Professor Dmitry Poldnikov uh, to be our speaker. Uh, I'll just quickly introduce uh, Professor uh, Poldnikov to everyone. Uh, Professor Poldnikov uh, teaches at the National Research University Higher School of Economics, Faculty of Law in Moscow. And uh, he teaches legal history, uh, comparative law. He's an expert in uh, Russian legal history, European legal history, comparative legal history, uh, as well as Roman law. Uh, and he is no stranger to China. He has previously taught uh, as a visitor, visiting professor at the Chinese Univer China University of Politics and Law, CUPL. Uh, and lived in Beijing for a period of time. Uh, and he has also served as an invited researcher uh, at the Max Planck Institute for European Legal History, the Max Planck Institute for Private International Comparative Law in Germany, as well as Harvard Law School in the United States. And Professor Poldnikov today will speak to us on the topic in Search of the Way Between East and West, Understanding Russian Law Through the Grammar of Legal Traditions. Professor Poldnikov will speak for about 35 to 40 minutes, after which we will open the floor to questions and answers and discussion. And the last thing just to uh, announce to everybody is that uh, this event is being recorded uh, and will be posted uh, eventually online on the Peking University School of Transnational Law's official social media accounts. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming and warmly welcoming uh, Professor Poldnikov. Uh, Professor Poldnikov, over to you. Thank you, Norman. Uh, thank you, Professor Ho. Uh, first of all, let me express my deep gratitude and satisfaction uh, to receive this uh, invitation to talk for the International School of Transnational School of Pe uh, Peking University. Uh, the occasion uh, results from a truly transnational event. Uh, we never met with Professor Ho in person. He read my paper, he messaged me and we arranged for, for this talk. So isn't it the, the sign of transnational advances of technology and communication? My presentation builds on my previous teaching and research experience. Uh, and uh, my first impression, my first idea was to uh, focus on the broader picture <laughs> of the uh, grammar of legal civilizations. But then I started to gather more materials and assess the time that I have uh, with um, the ability to explain things clearly. And I decided to focus more on some practical things. Uh, so let me share the presentation slide. So the title is the same. You probably uh, uh, saw it uh, in the poster. Uh, but the idea is uh, to start not with the bigger picture, but with something more specific. You know, not every law becomes transnational. Uh, some areas of law are more parochial, special, national, or even regional. Uh, but contract law uh, looks like the best candidate for this transnational or universal law uh, future, a rosy future. So I will start with something which looks like the universal principle of the freedom of contract uh, and uh, show you that it might give the false impression of understanding foreign law. Then 
uh, it will lead me to the, the idea of a bigger picture of legal systems and legal trans traditions. Uh, after explaining the basic grammar and elements of, of these larger concepts, I'll move to Russian law uh, to put it in context. Uh, and after that, uh, I'll show you how you can benefit uh, from this bigger picture in better understanding the freedom of contract uh, in Russian experience. All right, so it's 35 minutes. Uh, you don't have to be expert in Russian law to figure out that uh, this law is uh, uh, codified uh, and you uh, all you need uh, to take the code and find the relevant article. Uh, and you have an impression that you understand the meaning. Well, actually, this article uh, of the Civil Code of the Russian Federation, uh, the first part enacted in 1994, is a bit longer uh, than the summary that, that I've just showed. Uh, but uh, in order to economize on time, uh, I'll uh, skip to this general part and uh, go straight to the principles which look must look quite famil familiar to you it is not allowed to force the making of a contract unless otherwise provided by the law parties may enter into any type of contract uh, parties may establish any contractual terms except when a particular term is governed by law right so uh, uh, it might give you some idea of russian contract law and the principle of freedom of contract uh, if you compare it uh, with uh, truly transnational codifications, private codifications of contract law, like the principle of European contract law or the principles of international commercial contracts, you will find quite similar provisions on freedom of contract and some mandatory rules. I'll spare your time not to read it aloud. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that you are uh, well versed with, with these documents. Uh, based on this text, uh, may I ask you a question? Uh, is it allowed uh, under Russian law? Will Russian courts enforce uh, the agreement on partial, uh, partial assignment of debt? Partial assignment of debt. Not the whole debt, but just partial assignment of debt. Or a similar question, will the Russian courts enforce uh, uh, an agreement uh, uh, to pay penalty not in money but in kind? Uh, in the 90s and early 2000s, the answer would be most likely would be no. Agreements providing for forfeit in kind, not in money, or agreements providing for partial assignment of claim or debt would, would not be enforced by Ru most Russian courts. Not all of them, but the practice was standing to invalidating the, the agreements. Another curious trend, which does not go in line with the literal meaning of the freedom of contract principle, is that uh, the Russian courts classified in nominate uh, or atypical contracts as typical and applied the relevant provisions of the civil code. That is, they might limit uh, the amount of uh, the forfeit uh, on the grounds uh, of the article, or the relevant article. Although this forfeit might be uh, not in money but in kind, and this is a special kind of forfeit. So the question is, why judges uh, applied law non in accordance with the literal interpretation, literal meaning of the civil code? And this is where uh, we actually need to look at the bigger picture of Russian law, uh, which leads me to the first question of this short presentation on the legal systems or legal families. Uh, Perhaps you, 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 you saw this picture that gives you some idea of legal diversity of the world, civil law countries, common law countries, uh, uh, Muslim law countries, customary law, and some mixture thereof. 
uh, and uh, it introduces uh, the, the bigger concepts uh, that could help us to put the principle of contract law, freedom of contract or the like uh, into a context. So uh, if we talk about the legal system, a concept which is well established uh, in the textbooks on comparative law, uh, it can be defined either narrowly uh, in the English language literature as an agency of conflict resolution, as well as an agency of dispute settlement, or in a broader uh, meaning uh, defined by the continental scholars, uh, French, the Germans, and also Russians, uh, as legal organization of the society uh, that includes such components as the body of legal norms, legal agencies, ideology, legal scholarship, legal culture, legal practice, virtually any element uh, that uh, has to do with actual uh, uh, legal relationships and dispute resolution. The uh, problem with this uh, concept is that it's not only large uh, and somewhat vague, but uh, it focuses on static and description view of the world's legal diversity. Uh, it can help you to, uh, uh, to find the places where to look for answers, uh, but it does not always explain you why uh, those solutions, why those answers uh, came up in the first place. Uh, and uh, the second reason, but as a comparative lawyer, perhaps you might not need to ask for those answers as to why. Why is freedom of contract uh, somewhat limited uh, uh, in Russian jurisdiction? But as an academics, uh, scholars uh, or students, right? Uh, I am as an academic uh, can't help asking the question why. If you don't know the causes, you don't know the uh, legal system actually. And this why question brings me to another big concept which is called legal tradition, uh, which can be defined uh, in the way uh, John Merriman defined it in his textbook uh, or Thomas Duvet in his uh, 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 comprehensive uh, article uh, as historical underpinnings of modern law uh, or as a set of deeply rooted, historically conditioned attitudes about the nature of law and uh, the role of law in the society. Uh, the valuable part of this concept is that it focuses on the evolution, the change of, of uh, legal elements combined in the concept of the legal system. Uh, and it provides us with the genetic explanation. The law is the way it is, because there were some previous developments, evolutions. And the last uh, major concept of this presentation is the word grammar. I took it from linguistics uh, because uh, now it can be used also in an extended sense as the basic elements of an area of knowledge or skill. Uh, the thing is that uh, both legal systems and legal traditions uh, share the same elements that, because they has to do with the law. Uh, and uh, in order to grab the, uh, the vein uh, of this research into the question of why it is the way it is, uh, you have to pay attention to the uh, social and state institutes, the actors within the domain of law, because law is intersubjective reality, it does not exist uh, in the animal world or uh, 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 among the plants. So uh, the second bigger bulk uh, can be tapped uh, legal paradigm, uh, general theories or legal style. Uh, it provides lawyers with the framework that shapes legal solutions, specific uh, doctrines and rules. Uh, and the final part uh, deals with uh, particular doctrines and rules that help us 
to resolve uh, particular disputes. This is a simplified concept, but it, at least it gives you the right direction uh, into the, your search for answers to the question of why. Uh, it is uh, it is necessary to mention that uh, this general structure uh, varies across the nations and civilizations, of course, across time and space. Uh, and uh, if you uh, ask for a general picture, uh, then there must be some kind of uh, classification uh, of the legal variety. Uh, there might be several criteria. Uh, a historical one uh, or a combination of, of those criteria uh, for the purpose of dispute resolution uh, me and my colleague uh, professor Yuli, Yuri Fogelson focused on the functional uh, typology of legal traditions from the perspective how uh, actors uh, lawmakers judges uh, feel about the law, what are the attitudes, how do they plan to use the law, how they actually use it. Uh, and throughout history, there are at least three major attitudes towards this um, uh, uh, phenomen phenomenon of law. Law uh, can be regarded as a fair means to resolve conflicts and maintain uh, social order. This is a rather pragmatic attitude of uh, uh, English common law from the medieval times that was passed on to the American jurisdiction. Uh, but it also has parallels in Roman Republican law of the ancient times. But anyway, uh, the second type uh, regards law as a path of correct or righteous behavior and social order. Uh, it gives the touch of um, uh, instructing people of how to live the righteous life uh, as it was the case of medieval Roman canon law uh, and well, somewhat uh, later the enlightened law uh, which shaped the meaning of uh, civil law legal system in many ways. Uh, and the third type uh, uh, is uh, uh, well, it treats law as an instrument of governance, uh, which can be described as the rule by law. Uh, and the Chinese, Russian, or the Ottoman empires uh, gives us this idea of the politically controlled law uh, that puts an emphasis on penal and administrative justice. The thing is that uh, every attitude. Uh, 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 leads to uh, different legal techniques uh, uh, which actually shape the way lawyers uh, treat factual questions, how they pose legal questions, and how they come to solutions. So even if the solutions uh, are the same, the path towards the solutions might be different. So if we talk about common law, then we need to remember about the, primary, the primacy of procedure and reasoning by analogy, by way of example. If we talk about civil law, then it is about material justice so, and stipulating the rights and duties first, and then go into the uh, facts of the case. Uh, and it paved the way to the uh, legal doctrine, which I called here learned law, uh, and codification of law, law as a system. Uh, when we talk about politically controlled law, it is about the uh, primacy of material penal and ad ad administrative law. But uh, another dimension uh, that helps us uh, uh, have the, the fuller fledge of this legal, uh, legal, legal change uh, is the idea of legal values, because the legal solutions are ultimately uh, depending uh, on the social values. The traditional view uh, is to divide legal fa families, legal, uh, legal systems into Eastern and the Western. Uh, for someone who studies law in the 21st century, perhaps a more valuable, more practical view is to look at it from the perspective uh, of the uh, 
World Value Survey uh, conducted uh, since the early 1980s by the team of scholars uh, led by Ronald Inglehart, American professor of sociology from Michigan University. Uh, and uh, they surveyed uh, more than uh, 90 or almost 100 countries uh, for the period of uh, uh, 50 years now or 40 years. Uh, and they came up uh, with another subdivision uh, into traditional values and secular rational values in today's world. Traditional values, they call the values of survival. They are typical for the societies that struggle to move from uh, agricultural to industrial society uh, and didn't make it to the world of the well-being. Uh, while the value of self-expression or the secular rational values uh, uh, be become priority in societies uh, that uh, jump from um, industrial society to information society. Uh, and the social values uh, of survival uh, favor uh, conservative attitude, uh, more close society view, while the values of self-expression uh, prioritize uh, well, democratic and pluralistic view of the society. So this is about uh, all the uh, major concepts uh, that we need to uh, draw a more comprehensive uh, legal map of the world. Uh, also to group countries by clusters of cultures and values. Uh, as on this slide, you can see that uh, the uh, Western uh, legal systems, uh, European uh, and uh, Anglo-American, tend to be placed here uh, to the values uh, of uh, self-expression to the right of the image uh, and uh, somewhat up uh, on, on the scale with the secular rational values. While uh, the topic of my discussion will be to the uh, uh, less mm, uh, self-expression values, the more survival values uh, and uh, uh, somewhat uh, less religious attitude towards the world. Uh, if you are somewhat lost by now, I, I can understand you. Uh, people, uh, scholars think about uh, this scheme for, for, the whole, for their whole academic life. Uh, the helping hand here uh, is to choose the right filter. What do we need to take from all these uh, large containers of information? Uh, and one of the best answers to this uh, I took from the works of Italian comparatist Rodolfo Sacco, a great scholar uh, of comparative law uh, who died uh, this year precisely uh, and lived a very productive a long life. Uh, he uh, suggested uh, comparatists to focus uh, on the factors uh, which determine how legal cases will be resolved now or in the near future. He called those factors, the factors is actually not a legal term. Uh, we we uh, get used to uh, the sources of law, rather legal doctrines, but he chooses uh, this word of legal formants in order to uh, devise the term which can be applicable across the jurisdictions. So his idea and the idea of his pupils is that you need to subdivide those factors into the major ones, which are the sources of law in the given jurisdiction, uh, the supplementary ones like uh, legal values, principles, the ways of reasoning, uh, and the hidden legal formants like common sense, biases, stereotypes, that are not expressed in the text of the court decision, but still they, they impact uh, the judge uh, in his judgment. Uh, 
And those formants uh, are packed uh, into legal systems uh, if uh, you deal with the, uh, the results of the research. Uh, but if you uh, would like to find hidden uh, formants, uh, you need to go to legal traditions and find the uh, roots of the stereotypes of biases. All right, this is the filter that we apply to Russian law in order to explain the uh, freedom of contract and its limitations. Uh, I will briefly uh, introduce you to the uh, major components of uh, legal Russian legal tradition. Uh, the courts uh, does not pose a major challenge to understand because the legal system is uh, fairly comparable with the legal system of uh, continental Europe. Uh, there are, there used to be uh, three major uh, apex courts, the Constitutional Court, the Supreme Court, uh, and the Higher Arbitration Court, uh, who shared uh, the um, jurisdiction in constitutional matters, uh, in major criminal and uh, civil matters, uh, and commercial disputes. Uh, as Russia is a federal republic, uh, uh, there are uh, several instances. Uh, the first instance uh, of district courts uh, and commercial courts, uh, the uh, appeal instance uh, uh, for each jurisdiction that I named, uh, and the cassation instance uh, uh, for, for the uh, check of uh, the matters of law, not only the matters of fact. The Supreme Court of the Russian Federation that uh, uh, incorporates now the subdivision on the higher court uh, of arbitration uh, serves as the second cassation for special occasions. Uh, this structure uh, does not uh, is not replica of the French or German system. This is the special Russian way, but uh, the elements of the structure is fairly visible and uh, you don't see any uh, challenges to understand uh, the system. If we talk about the sources of Russian law, then uh, the best way to think about it is to imagine the pyramid of legal norms. On top of this pyramid, uh, the most important is the constitution of the Russian Federation that stipulates the system of values principles and rights, there are international treaties, the federal constitutional laws, uh, and the federal laws. Uh, if we talk about matters of civil law, then uh, we need to pay attention to the constitutional principles, uh, plus the federal laws, the civil code, and the special laws that uh, provide the additional regulations. Uh, we don't need to pay attention to the legislation of the subjects of the Federation because the civil law matters uh, are a matter of federal legislation. Uh, also, bylaws uh, are of uh, lesser importance for this area of law. So uh, it's just to give you the overall impression. Uh, the main question for most practitioners is what about court practice? Well, court decisions uh, uh, are technically uh, not the source of law. There is no binding judicial precedent in Russia because Russia belongs to the civil law uh, system. However, according to the legislation, the, the federal uh, uh, constitutional laws, the decisions of the constitutional court may invalidate any normative act due to its non-compliance with the constitution. For this reason, many scholars call the Constitutional Court the negative legislator. Uh, and uh, the Constitutional Court uh, takes the attitude of interpreting all the areas of Russian law from the point of view of the constitutional values. Also, the freedom of contract, as I will show you later. Uh, the Supreme Court uh, of, Russia, of the Russian Federation and the former High Court of uh, High Commercial Court uh, issues resolutions on matters of judicial practice 
which are binding uh, on the course of the lower instance in terms of the interpretation of the laws. That is, the lower instances may not understand the letter of the legislation in some other way. In that sense, uh, the Supreme Court uh, contributes to the development of Russian law, uh, also in matters of civil law, of course. Uh, and the courts of appeal and cassation, uh, uh, the, the, their decisions may be used as legal guidance for lawyers uh, because sometimes the practice varies across the uh, areas of, of those courts. Uh, the overall impression, the mentality, the, this, the, the mental set uh, of Russian lawyers is shaped mainly by the uh, trend of legal positivism uh, in its continental meaning, of course. Uh, law uh, is usually defined as a set of binding rules of correct behavior that are created and are enforceable by governmental institutions. Uh, most of the, uh, the the main source of law is the legislation, and the most important parts of the legislation are codified. No surprise here. Uh, the laws uh, are to be interpreted uh, uh, with the help of the four uh, methods of interpretation known to German legal scholarship since the 19th century: literal, systematical, teleological, and historical. Uh, and uh, the laws are usually to be applied uh, with their clear literal meaning uh, by applying a general rule or to particular cases. That is, the courts are seen as resolving a legal syllogism uh, where the uh, main premise, the bigger premise, uh, is the legal norm and the smaller premise uh, just the matters uh, uh, of, the, of the case, merits of the case. Uh, however, having said this, positivism uh, does not exist without its challenges and the Constitutional Court of uh, Russia uh, advances uh, interpretation of the laws in accordance with the system of basic rights uh, and secular rational values. So that suggests something beyond the legislation. Uh, the system of values uh, and the mentality of Russian lawyers uh, must be interpreted through the uh, prism of several layers of Russian legal tradition, where comparative law, uh, contemporary, sorry, contemporary law uh, is shaped largely uh, uh, in opposition with the socialist law, but uh, there are many uh, re uh, um, relics of social law, socialist law uh, in today's legal system, uh, including well, uh, the factors that limit the freedom of contract, as I will show you in a moment. Uh, and there is uh, an important period, although a very short one, uh, which can be called the golden age of Russian legal scholarship. Uh, I called it here the reformed imperial law which coincided with the process of uh, the modernization of Russian society, and economy and governmental structures. And you can compare it with the period of Meiji restoration uh, in the 19th century, actually. The medieval princely law, of course, is of historical uh, minor importance for contemporary law, right? Uh, and this slide I took again from the um, uh, research of Ronald Inglehart on the cultural evolution, just to show you that uh, the attitude of Russian society towards values can change even within well, 35 or 40 years from the uh, late Soviet period uh, to the contemporary days. Uh, in the times of social instability, uh, the values of survival uh, became more significant, as you can see on this second dot. Uh, and it also uh, meant that uh, courts uh, might look for uh, ways to protect the disadvantaged uh, litigants. Uh, well, 
the the restoration of the economy uh, facilitated the uh, change towards the values of self-expression. All right. So uh, where are we uh, in terms of legal formants of Rodolfo Sacco? How can we apply the filter of practical dispute resolution? Surely, if we talk about the freedom of contract, we need to look at uh, Article 421, uh, which stipulates three major uh, rules with regard to uh, the freedom of contract. But we may not uh, miss the uh, resolution of the plenum of the Higher Arbitration Court that suggested the mandatory interpretation of, of the same article uh, in, in his resolution uh, from uh, 2014 on the freedom of contract and its limits. Uh, there are four major clauses uh, in this ruling. The first one uh, provides that the rules of the civil code shall be pres uh, presumed as discretionary, not mandatory, as many courts of the lower instances suggested. Uh, the second and the third clause uh, stipulated that this presumption is rebuttable uh, and it may be overcome by textual or theological interpretation of the applicable rule. And the fourth important clause uh, is that uh, 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 even the same rule may be understood by courts as discretionary or mandatory, depending on the merits of the case. This is quite an important uh, explanation for the lower courts uh, that uh, can be compared in significance only with the position of the constitutional court. And I would say that uh, the judges of the constitutional court tended to interpret uh, the freedom of contract in a liberal way. I'll just summarize for you a very recent uh, ruling of the Constitutional Court on the constitutionality of several articles of the Civil Code, including uh, the article on the freedom of contract. The facts. Well, uh, uh, the applicant uh, rented an apartment for a short term and failed to pay the rent twice the landlord unilaterally terminated the lease according to its terms right everything according to the contract the courts uh, held in favor of the landlord who sued for uh, damages uh, uh, and also uh, he evicted uh, the tenant the legal issue uh, so this uh, applicant, or tenant, uh, Miss uh, Pikina, uh, uh, claimed that uh, the rule of uh, uh, of uh, Article six hundred eighty seven uh, stipulates uh, a mandatory rule regarding the grounds to terminate the lease unilaterally. That is, it cannot be changed by the contract uh, of the parties. Uh, and uh, this rule uh, suggests that the contract can be terminated only if there are more than two uh, defaults on payment. Not one, not two, just more than two. So this is the mandatory rule. Moreover, uh, the applicant claimed that the language of several articles so of the civil code on contracts is so ambiguous that uh, it allows the courts uh, to uh, uh, interpret arbitrarily and inconsistently the rights of tenants. The Constitutional Court uh, held uh, not in favor of this applicant. It rejected uh, uh, her uh, application under the following motives or with the following motives. The provisions uh, on on contracts of this civil code shall be interpreted in accordance with the system of basic rights and values. The rule, uh, the, the debatable rule of the civil code on tenants does not suggest mandatory procedure on termination of contract. Uh, moreover, uh, it doesn't follow not only from the literal interpretation, it doesn't follow either from the teleological interpretation because a mandatory rule 
uh, which uh, would prohibit the landlord to terminate the lease may amount to disproportionate limitation of her rights and lawful expectations. So the uh, parties are free to um, provide for the procedure of terminating the uh, lease contract under Article 421 in accordance with the freedom of contract. Right, so this is the position of the Constitutional Court. Uh, obviously, this is not all we need to know in order to uh, figure out how the courts of the law instance uh, may adjudicate the contract. The hidden legal formants uh, that scholars like Professor Belov or Antonov uh, identified can be summarized as follows. The courts are usually uh, of non-liberal attitude uh, because they regard themselves as the guardians of the state and public interests. Uh, the judges also uh, tend to be uh, to, to stick to rigid legal formalism. Uh, and they also, some of them at least, uh, 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 advocate paternalistic or protective attitude towards litigants. Non-typical agreements uh, might violate the lawful interests and of the disadvantaged parties, so we will not uh, enforce them, right? or at least not all of them. So these are the hidden formants that uh, were distilled through the legal tradition uh, research. So the actual uh, rules regarding the freedom of contract uh, uh, in court practice might be summarized as follows. There is a hardly rebuttable presumption of mandatory legal rules uh, in the civil code. Judicial tendency, there is a judicial tendency to treat atypical agreements uh, as nominate of mixed contracts and therefore limiting the uh, freedom of contract. And there is also presumption of unenforceability of atypical contracts due to possible infringement of lawful interests. Uh, are these uh, hidden formants uh, uh, changeable, right? Can they be changed? There are some indications as to this change possible. Uh, first of all, the very resolution of the plenum of the Supreme Arbitration uh, uh, Court uh, that I summarized earlier. Uh, although, uh, I may draw your attention to the uh, citations. Uh, usually, uh, this resolution uh, is cited by the commercial courts. There are over 1,500 citations uh, since 2014 and only 22 citations by the courts of general jurisdiction, which resolve the disputes of non-professional um, uh, traders, uh, right, just the conventional people. Uh, the Supreme Court's tendency is still to treat atypical agreements by analogy uh, with typical contracts uh, and to apply the provisions of the civil code for their typical contracts. That is, uh, if you devise uh, a special kind of penalty in kind, uh, your contract will still be subject to the limitation to the penalty in money, uh, and it can be reduced uh, uh, by the court uh, if the court uh, sees it as an excessive forfeit on the Article 333. Uh, uh, what would be the trend for the upcoming years? Uh, actually, nobody knows, but uh, from what we see now, the situation in the economy uh, does not suggest that Russians will be better off. Uh, and uh, there are some uh, trends towards more conservative uh, uh, legal policy. So I suppose uh, the values of uh, uh, survival uh, and the paternalistic attitude towards the uh, contractual agreements uh, would remain uh, and uh, only the future will show whether my prediction is correct. But uh, for the final remark, uh, I uh, address, I uh, uh, 
I suggest that uh, uh, the organizer of the seminar uh, circulate my presentation and you will find suggested readings on the final slides uh, that cover both the concept of legal traditions uh, and uh, gives you some uh, starting point for the study of Russian law, including well, a wonderful summary of the research guide in Russian law uh, made by uh, several uh, emigre graduates of St. Petersburg University uh, for the New York Global Research uh, School of International Law uh, with the further references. With this, uh, I abused my time a bit, but I thank you for your attention I, and I hope that there will be some discussion that shows that my message uh, were true. Thank you.